so thank, welcome, um, and thank you so much for coming. It's just really exciting. I thought this time of year it would be tough to get people here. It's so beautiful outside. So, and I know there's a lot going on in town. So we really appreciate your participation. Just so you know, and it's my fault. I screwed up the Zoom link that was on in the papers and everything else. And so if you know somebody that wants to participate, um, here is the Zoom meeting ID and password. Um, it will be recorded and we'll put it on the county's website, but I screwed up. And alternately, if they want to call USU NOAA, they can do that. And we have the same information. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. <laughs> I, you know, we came in and it was all starting to go to hell right away. And I said, I'm not an event coordinator. Life goes on. Let's yep. go. Right. So um, my name is Trisha Dean. I am a part of the Grand County Commission. And Grand County has put a lot of effort into trying to educate our citizens as to the water resources in this valley. We've also are starting to put a lot of money into monitoring and modeling water resources in our valley. We think, think it's extremely important. And so if you as citizens have concerns, please pass those along to, to myself. Bill Winfield's also here, another county commissioner. That's what we are here to do is to listen to you. So this is part two of a three-part, maybe a four-part series. We're starting to go, maybe we should do this. <laughs> um, so yeah. goal, I know, right? The goal in the, the third part will be just um, water infrastructure systems within our valley. So we're hoping to have Moab Irrigation Company, Groundwater and Sewer, for example, present just their infrastructure, you know, their water rights, how they get water to people. It's a really crazy thing. I'm actually a TA in an environmental science class right now. One of the questions a couple of weeks ago was, where, do your, what, where does your water come from? A lot of, I don't have the slightest clue, right? So, out of the tap. Out of the tap, that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Sitting in the toilet bowl, no, I don't know. They don't usually say that. <laughs> um, so I wanna really thank um, additional volunteers that have helped me, so Bob O'Brien, Alice Drogan and Ronnie Grossery have helped me exponentially, so I want to thank them. And then I want to thank our presenters. So, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment, but Jack Schmidt, Tom Lockmer, where is Mike? Mike's back there too. Dunaway, um, two have tra traveled very far to be here to educate our community, and we're not paying them. Did you guys know that? Sorry. Don't crap. No, we're not. said, but here's a hotel that we're covering, except when we just tried to check in, yep. the county card bounced. The bounce. <laughs> Don't worry. You guys should worry about that. That's a class act. So a couple, a few rules of engagement before we get started. So please, please, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. So there's going to be three presentations, approximately about half an hour each. If you can hold your questions, if you want to jot them down, make a note in your phone, I would appreciate that. That way they can just keep moving along and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, during the Q&A, please be respectful of others. Please. You know, raise your hand, don't just speak out of turn. I, as the facilitator, will try to be like calling on people and making sure I'm getting around the room to everybody. I will do my very best. Please remember that this is not politics. This is the dissemination of information by scientists and specialists in their field and the research that they have done and or that they, have, they know a lot about. So they're just disseminating that information. Um, there are drinks. In the coolers, please take as much as you would like. And um, at the end, if you would just kind of help us making sure you don't leave things, um, USU has afforded us this using this facility so if we can leave it clean. I'd really appreciate it. So thank you so much. So we're gonna start with Jack Schmidt. And this is kind of funny. Um, I'm from the 80s, I grew up in the 80s and probably I had, like my heart would beat over Nikki Six right, from Molly Crew, And now it's like, I was so excited to meet Jack. I felt kind of the same way. What happened to me? 
Um, so a little bit, I know, a little bit about Dr. Jack Schmidt. He was, he was um, the director of the Center for Colorado River Studies, the Janet Quinney Lawson Chair in Colorado River Studies Emeritus, Chief of the U.S. Geological Survey Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center from 2011 to 2014. Dr. Schmidt's research has focused on the effects of dams and reservoirs on rivers, environmental change on rivers, and development of strategies for mitigating the adverse effects of river development. And at this workshop, he will speak about present and future stream flow and water use on the Colorado River. So I am bringing Thanks. him up. Thanks. Let me see. I am going to pay attention to time. Hi, I'm Jack. I live in Logan. Uh, it's great to be here. I love I love um, being down here. I love um, talking to citizens of the Colorado Basin and doing what I can to help empower and um, inform you on decisions and information that we all we all need to participate in. Today, I'm just going to talk about water. Uh, no environment, no sediment. I'm mostly going to focus on uh, the upper basin, but I'm going to start with context. I'm aware that this is just a warm up act of context because this is mostly just all about the river that flows by you. And that Tom will be talking about what really matters here in terms of what you access in your water supply. And I'm not going to make any attempt to um, uh, cover that. And um, this is a group, some of some of you I'm, I'm very lucky to know as friends and, and uh, others I don't know. I'm gonna, my hunch is that most of you come into this with some understanding of the color of the river. So I'm not gonna go through a bunch of boilerplate, you know, Colorado rivers, whatever. We're, um, my focus is actually gonna be, we're gonna look at a lot of numbers. And then I'm going to sort of tell you why they make a difference, but there's going to be a hell of a lot of graphs here and a lot of numbers. And so we got 27 minutes. <laughs> so, right, this would be the standard thing. And we go through a bunch of slides of pictures like this. We Here's our one slide. Here's, uh, you know, 40 million people. The interesting thing about 40 million people, and this is a number you've all heard, is be careful how you use that number. 20 of those 40 live in Southern California. So just be careful how you play that card. It might come back and bite you. Um, lots of irrigated land. Importantly, about 90% of the winter produce consumed in the United States and Canada is produced in the Yuma, Imperial, uh, and Mexicali Valley in the winter. That's non-trivial, right? And uh, so there's our basic deal. All right, ultimate and proximate causes of the water crisis of today. Mike's gonna talk about this. So I'm gonna blow right by this and uh, a warming climate, which is projected to continue to warm, is resulting in reduced runoff in the Colorado River system. Okay? That's the deal. Mike's going to fill in the rest. Every dot on this graph, every dot is reclamation's estimate of the natural flow of the Colorado River at these ferries. The natural flow means the water that's in the river today plus all consumptive uses and losses. So it's essentially what would the river flow at if there were no humans? 
So any trends here would be related to climate, right? Because we've eliminated humans out of this. And so um, the black line is sort of a running average here at the 1980s, uh, really wet. Um, and these best fit, these smooth lines sort of dampen out the extreme variability. But what's important is that the scientific community sort of thinks about the Colorado River as three fundamentally different uh, episodes. Before 1930, what we call the early 20th century pluvial, that's just sort of a wet period. Ironically, the period when the Colorado River Compact was negotiated. The middle and late 20th century. And then after 2000, what we now call the millennium drought. And what I've shown here in horizontal lines is the average for that period. So even though that's the average, there were drier and wetter periods, okay? And um, what's important is that since 2000, the average 12.5 million acre feet of water at Lee's Ferry is 13% less than the mid to late 20th century and 30% less than it was in the early part of the 20th century. Okay? This is a climate signature. And um, uh, this is the estimate for what would flow in the Colorado River at least very no dams, no humans. The proximate cause is that we consume too much water relative to the natural supply. And so, this is a plot that goes back to 1981. And in blue is the annual supply, the natural supply at least Ferry, the graph that I just showed you, plus about 800,000 acre feet of water that comes into the Colorado River within the Grand Canyon, all the springs of the Grand Canyon plus 300,000 that comes in below, you know, the Virgin and, and, and some, some uh, uh, streams coming in uh, below. So this is the total supply that's available to be divvied up. And then in red is the total consumptive use of water in the entire basin, including Mexico and including reservoir evaporation. And I could give a talk on how I developed this, but we're just, I'm just saying, oh, there's a red line. Well, trust me, this was a hell of a lot of work to get. <laughs> okay, and it only goes to, 19, to 2020 because the upper basin has not reported its water use since 2020, not a great situation. So when blue is bigger than red, we have an excess of water in the system. When, uh, Red is higher than blue, we're using more water than we have in that year. That's the deal. And um, so we can do all the numbers, but what's important is the average for the entire 21st century of the total supply in the system has been 13.6 million acre feet. And the average consumptive use, the red line has been 15. And so you don't have to remember the numbers, except that we all know the 15 is bigger than 30. <laughs> hey, you know what? I forgot already. When did I start? I don't know. <laughs> 605? Yeah, 605. Okay, let's say 605. Yeah. Thanks. I All thought right. this was about the credit card. All right, okay. So, so, so um, how did we, how do we spend more than we have, how, how do you spend more than you have income? You drain your checking account. You drain the reservoirs. When we started the 21st century, the reservoirs were effectively full. And um, this is all of the reservoirs in the Colorado River system, whether they're federal, whether they're city of Denver, whether they're strawberry reservoir, any, every reservoir in the system, this is where we're at. But the important thing is 
that between when they were full and the trough before the 2023 runoff season began, we lost about 38 million acre feet of water. Now, we don't need to remember 38, except we remember that the average consumptive use for everything, including Mexico, was a number like 15. So that's two and a half times the annual consumptive use of the whole damn base. Okay, we drained out of the system. Um, right now, the sum of Mead and Powell, and I'm not going to talk at all about the fate of Lake Powell in this talk. I'm only going to talk about Mead plus Powell. Because to me, they're one reservoir. They're one giant reservoir, the two largest in the United States, separated by a scenic bedrock ditch. <laughs> so, effectively, they're one reservoir. And we can argue about whether it's better to store the water in Powell or me. It doesn't matter who for water supply. So I'm just going to talk about the total amount in Powell and Mead. And the sum total of all the water in Powell and Mead right now, despite the big runoff year of 2023, is we're back where those reservoirs were at in June of 2021. No better than that. No better than that. Okay, this is a good one to remember. Um, these percentages sort of change, but you're all aware there's lots of reservoirs in the system. Um, 60 to 80 percent, depends whether the system is relatively full or relatively empty. 60 to 80 percent of all the water and all the reservoirs of the entire system is in Powell and Mead, period. Um, you know, somewhere between 16 and 30 four reservoirs in the upper basin. And um, four to eight percent is in Mojave and Havasu. So the message is, if you're concerned about water supply, it's all about Powell and Mead, period. That's where all the water is. Okay. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, right now, Powell and Mead are in the 35% range of capacity. They got about the same amount of water. Um, uh, and there you go. There's... Endless numbers. I'll share this. All right, so let's just blast through for a minute. How did we get into this situation? This proximate cause. And I'm going to divide the history of reservoir storage in the system into three simple parts. The first is the big crash. The big crash is these first years, five years, 2000 to 2004, when we plummeted in runoff and supply in the system, and we thought we were trying to reduce storage, and we congratulated, we meaning society, congratulated itself as it was able to reduce, you know, its use in California, whatever. Well, that didn't at all match what was going on. So this is the messiness of a democracy. A democracy is messy, slow, unresponsive, congratulates itself on hard-won <laughs> agreements that don't do the job. Well, because democracy is messy. And so um, there's a big crash. And then the next big part of it is, despite the big crash, then we had some good years, um, 05, 07, Here's 11, 17, 19, good years. So we sort of lived with ups and downs that sort of were in balance. Um, we're sort of in balance, uses and supply. But the problem was the system never refilled. We had a big crash and then we never recovered. Now I'm very aware that when I use words like it never recovered, in the eyes of some people, they might say that's a huge problem. In the eyes of other people, they might say that's the best thing in the world. Now we suddenly have all sorts of things popping out of Lake Powell. That's a different question. We're talking about water supply management. Okay, so we lived on the edge, 
buried in here are all sorts of, of agreements uh, amongst the states and the feds, lots of self-congratulation, but <laughs> there we go. Now realize, I can tell it this way because I have the hindsight, I have the you know, 2020 vision of hindsight, right? Then we have the next crash, except the next crash, we lived on the edge, we never recovered. And so then when we had the next big crash of 2020 to 2022 with no more water, we went down to catastrophe and we went down to years of newspaper articles and everything that, that was what went on in those years. We hadn't rebuilt storage. That's this year. Now, whatever we might worry about what the numbers were for water flow or what the numbers are for consumptive use, that's how much water is in the reservoirs. And that's a quantifiable number. That's a pretty accurate number. So that's how much we got in total increase in Powell and Mead. And then you see how these things turn over? That's because the reservoir storage peaked in the middle of July, and now we're back to spend. So, needless to say, you know, here's the graph. Somebody says to you, oh, 2023 was great. We don't have to worry about water anymore. There you go. And these are, you know, everything I show you is reclamation and USGS data. Um, here you go, 2011, the biggest runoff year of the 21st century. We increased basin storage by nearly 9 million acre feet. I mean, so here are the numbers of how much we increased, but here's the sobering thing. We blew through every drop of that water in less than two years because we weren't able to, re as a society, reduce consumptive use. And in 2019, a big year as nearly as big as 2023, we also blew through all of it in two years, which is pretty humbling to say, we got this big increase this year, and unless we radically reduce consumptive use, we have, we've done it before, we've completely squandered it, and we can do it again. So that's where we are today. So let's look at consumptive use. Here are our enemies or our friends in the lower basin. Uh, California is the big dog. Arizona, Mexico, Nevada. Here's the sum of these plus reservoir evaporation. And um, these are big numbers. So let's just sort of uh, look at these numbers. And if you add 8.8 .8 and 1.5 to Mexico, right? I mean, that's a number that's heading around a number like 10 million acre feet. In contrast, in the upper basin, you've got some total consumptive uses that are half. So the upper basin is using half of what the lower basin and Mexico use. And the biggest user is Colorado. The second biggest user is Utah. In Utah, like in every other state, the biggest user is irrigated agriculture. These numbers are reclamation numbers approved by the Upper Basin Commission. I'm not making any of this up. This isn't some pointed headed guy who has some new algorithm and model that hasn't been tested. This is just the damn published data of reclamation. It's all agriculture. In Utah, this is the amount of water going to the Wasatch Front primarily out of Strawberry and out of the Duchesne River system. 
we sort of portray the problem as if it's, oh, we have a desperate need for protect water to protect cities and the children and old people of urban areas. Um, that's where the water is being used. Uh, these are published data, uh, or these are data by reclamation of just the amount of water used by irrigated agriculture. And this is the amount of irrigated land. Um, I can't explain these two numbers, but that's what's in their spreadsheet. But irrigated agriculture is increasing. It's not here in Moab. You know, it's in the U, it's in the Uinta Basin, but I thought everybody would like to see this. Okay. Um, Ryan Richter, a bunch of other people have gone through laborious work to figure out where the water in irrigated agriculture goes in the basin. 55% of all the water used by agriculture in the basin goes for livestock feed. Most of it is alfalfa. It's not grown lettuce and you. Um, we got to confront this. So all of these water budgets of what's coming in and what's going out get us to this is how the present legal system has allocated water in the 21st century. We got all the water that comes in in the upper basin, 12.5 million acre feet on average. We're using about 4 million acre feet in the upper basin, which means the difference between these two numbers is what gets to Powell. Nothing comes out of Powell. We add about 800,000 acres, acre feet within the springs in the Grand Canyon. We evaporate off more than a million acre feet off of the surface of Powell and Mead. And then we start allocating it to California and Arizona. Mexico gets the last drops and nothing makes it to the sea. That's the deal. And um, I would point out that in some way, if you care about rivers, the best friend that the river running community of the river at Moab has is these guys. Because these guys guarantee that the water's heading downstream. And what works against you is these guys, even though we're upper basin people. It's a complicated array that we call the law of the river. It's way too complicated. Um, it's not just a Colorado River Compact. It's a Colorado River Compact, the Upper Basin Compact, Supreme Court ruling of the 1960s, binational treaty with Mexico, multiple laws, multiple administrative decisions that basically leads to an allocation in seniority. We gotta meet Mexico's delivery first. We have an international treaty. We must abide by treaties first. We have this unknown tribal reserve water rights by a convoluted history of the negotiation of these agreements. It's generally interpreted that the lower basin has a senior uh, right to the upper basin. But the reality is in the crisis of the moment, everybody's in this which that although I've taught this a gazillion times, say, well, this is it, you need to learn this. This is what Pat Mulroy said a number of years ago. You know, so long as we got a piece of paper that says the Colorado River Compact on the cover, and it says that the objective is the equitable division of water, and we got seven signatures of the seven states on the last page, it doesn't matter who, what's in between. And everything that's gone on in this century of renegotiating this is all changing the law of the river. But we say we're never going to change the law of the river, and then we need to change it. <laughs> and that's what's going on right now, because that's become most important. All right, let me. Um, and of course, the big unknown is the tribes, who, by guarantee of the Supreme Court ruling in 1906, 
have clear rights. And um, I'm just going to leave it that this administration has changed the rules and brought the tribes in at a meaningful level that has never really occurred before. I can't tell you how it's going to turn out. I can't tell you if in the end the tribes are going to be marginalized. But I can tell you that the tribes are very much part of the conversation. And we have no real agreement. So let me just close. I've got a couple minutes. And let's just go down to Grand County and the, and the river. Um, these are reclamations estimates of natural flow, no humans. Blue is the Colorado River near Cisco. Let's call it the Grand River. Um, the Green River, the San Juan. There's a slight, if you squint, uh, decreasing supply. Mike can explain whether that's really, you know, I mean, but those are reclamation's numbers. The measured wet water in the river by the USGS are these numbers. Everything shifted down. The height of this graph is the same. And this is a result of climate change, decreasing runoff, and consumptive use, right? So the point is, whether it's how much water flows in the river or how much water is in the reservoirs, the reservoirs are all bathtubs. And the thing you have to remember is it's not just climate change. Uh, the amount of water in a bathtub is not just how much is coming out of the faucet, but how much is going out the drain. And if we want to keep the reservoirs more full, you got to close down the drain. It's a management issue. So um, I really only have to, okay. Here is your river. Right? You're right here. In every number is the flow, annual flow in millions of acre feet at that gauge in the 21st century. So I just did this so that this might be kind of fun. 2.4 million acre feet is coming out of the upper Colorado. 1.4 is coming out of the Guns, okay? But let's forget about the numbers. I've compared these every gauge with the estimated flow of the river in the middle 20th century, normalized to water development in 1957. In blue, these are the only little places where the water flow today is the same as it estimated was in the middle of the 20th century. Um, darker blue and then the really lightest blue, that's today's flow is 70% of what it was. And then in the other shade are 60% or less. The flow of the Dolores River, I'm not telling you anything, is 40% of what it was in the middle of the 20th century, or zero. And it's all, you know, down the main Dolores, but even below the San Miguel, it's 40%. Plateau Creek is another one. Um, it's all because of the trans-basin diversions on the Continental Divide and the diversions at McPhee. But in the, in the Grand River Division, it's a little different. Ag uses 50% of the water, not 70%. Trans Basin exports to the Colorado Front Range, 30%, half a million acre feet. 12% goes out of McPhee to the Montezuma Valley. So the sum of these two is about 700,000 acre feet. Reservoir evaporation is peanuts. Municipal and industrial is peanuts. Okay? And um, uh, I'm just not even going to 
you do care about the green river and same color, same shade, pretty dark in the upper Yampa. The Yampa hasn't changed a lot. The upper green hasn't changed a lot. The Duchesne, 40% of what the flow was in the middle 20th century. That's a central Utah project and agriculture in the Uinta Basin. The San Rafael and the Price. So the sacrificed rivers of the Green River system are the San Rafael, the Price, and the Duchesne. In the Colorado and the Grand River Division, it's the Dolores and the streams immediately downstream from the headwater diversions that are going to get. This is what it all looks like if we now compare the flow of the rivers back to the early 20th century. In red is the hydrology of these rivers in the first 20 years, first 30 years of the 20th. 20th century. That's the Green River. Climate change and consumptive use, that's the Green River today. Grand River at Cisco, that's the old river. That's the river today. But more importantly, that's the San Juan River in the early 20th century. That's it today. Needless to say, it's a completely changed deal when you get to release this below Glen Canyon Dam. And needless to say, this is what the river looks like at the bottom. This is the flood hydrology at Yuma. That's the amount of water that crosses the border and every drop of that is now goes to the Mexicali Valley. So warming, so my message is, it's not just about a warming climate. We as a society have to decide how much water we consume, but our ability to greatly reduce is really challenged by all of the agreements. And we have not done it yet. So we ought to be scared about our ability to do it in the future. If you care, you'll let the people who represent you know that you care. Um, it's the only way that we can reduce use to match supply of a declining supply. And 2023 is not going to get us out of this. Thanks. Geologist for over 45 years. He holds multiple degrees in geology and worked on multiple consulting firms before joining the faculty uh, in geosciences, formerly, formerly geology for the department at the University, Utah State University in 1990. And so many Moab residents have wondered how to make sense of more than a desert water studies involving Moab and Spanish Valley water resources completed between 1971 and 2021. Um, Earlier on this year, right, January, yeah. he, um, Dr. Lockmer, did, is going to share his, he did share his findings, but going to share those again with us tonight um, from his scientific peer review of all those published works. Yeah. So are you good with that? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I have slightly modified this uh, because of things that changed between Grand County, who's interested in uh, having me. A grad student of mine, Jack Nosey, uh, do a modeling study based on recent uh, information that was collected primarily by the USGS. Um, well, I was hired initially just to read all the documents and then give my professional opinion. Um, and my, the notion here is uh, would a groundwater modeling investigation of the Moab Spanish Valley uh, Basin be beneficial at this time? Which I think it is, and Trisha agreed to that. So hopefully that will be funded uh, starting next year, a couple of years. Let's see, I have a 
in here. There we go. All right, as Jack just pointed out, uh, there's increased, increased groundwater withdrawals. Uh, we don't have as much water in the reservoirs. Surface water is going to grow alfalfa. I'm a vegetarian, by the way. Uh, and that's why, okay? Um, with decreased recharge as a result of climate change. So people get worried. Moab, I can understand, is a very dry area. I get worried about the water supply. Uh, there are two main investigations uh, recently um, that were uh, funded to see if there's any unappropriated water in this area. Um, the water rights are, are um, controlled by the division, Utah Division of Water Rights. You can't drill a well without permission. You can't appropriate water from surface water or groundwater without permission from the Division of Water Rights. Uh, so they really are the ones who make the decisions as to whether or not more water will be developed. And they, they like to think and I don't mean this in a negative way, that um, they have a handle on how much is there so they can, they're not over appropriating, not giving more water away than actually exists. Okay, it makes sense, I don't know. Uh, so these, these two investigations, the original investigation was back in 1971, and I'll refer back to that. The main concepts uh, was, were um, introduced at that time. Uh, there were four reports prepared for the city of Moab, uh, 2018 through 2020 uh, by Coleman Van der Heide. And then the USGS was doing a study. I don't know if they even knew each other at the time. We're doing similar studies. Uh, and they have this report came out in 2019. And then they published a paper based on that in the Journal of Hydrology in 2020. Um, and this is why I was selected for peer review. And this is what I'm doing. I'm going to have contact on summaries of the pertinent individual documents in their chronological order, it makes sense to me to go through them chronologically. This is what people thought, and then their thoughts changed, and this is why. And then at the end, on summary conclusion recommendations, that's where we quit. And the list of references, if anybody wants to go back and look at any of these documents. And then I had questions at the end, not knowing that they would be held until the very end. So please, when the question slide come on, don't ask questions. <laughs> I didn't know that until I got to there. Maybe I should take that slide out. Okay. <laughs> So this is, the, this is the drainage basin we're looking at. It actually, this is from the USGS study in 2019, and it extended beyond the actual basin. The basin line is this dashed line right here. So this is what we're looking at. Um, there's Moab, right? there's Ken's Lake, here are LaSalle's, which are the main recharge area. Uh, so this first study in 71, he identified two principal aquifer systems, which really hasn't changed. The Glen Canyon group, which are the Navajo and Wingate sandstones, they're Jurassic in age. I'll have a confusing thing here for you uh, later on. Fraternity deposits in the Spanish Valley, which are really shallow. Uh, he also created the first hydrologic balance. These hydrologic balances are important because this is how people estimate, this is how educated people who, who have expertise in this area uh, estimate how much unappropriated water may still be available, okay? Uh, and this is what the state, the state Division of Water Rights folks uh, use, uh, these documents. They don't necessarily collect much information themselves, don't they? Have others that, like the USGS and other folks that go out and collect it. So they're the ones that publish them, so I'm assuming that they collect it. Uh, this is an aerial view, trying to give you an idea of what we're going to be looking at. So here's the Spanish Valley, there are the Los Alves, the, this is the uh, Navajo sandstones on either side. There are major what we call normal faults. Normal meaning that this went up relative to this. So you're probably thinking, why do we have a valley in an area where the rocks were uplifted? And it's because of the uh, paradox formation. So named because it forms valleys. There's a paradox valley just over the border in Colorado. This is a, a paradox formation is um, evaporite deposits like salts and it dissolves in water, right? So it tends to just drop down from weathering, from rain. And then the sandstones are strong, right? So they stand up high. But this is actually higher geologically in terms of you're deeper down into the ground. This becomes important. Uh, so this is a sketch the USGS did showing the Moab Spanish Valley. This is where the um, Quaternary alluvium nests, the shallow deposits that are sitting on top of this paradox formation. So there is some groundwater in there, but it's thin 
and the water quality is actually not very good. And then this is the main, there's your sandstones on this side where the water flows in laterally and then crosses the fault or comes up at the fault. There are springs along here as well as uh, Moab city wells in that area as well. And then these are all the geologic units. I'm gonna buzz right through them. Here's the valley fill deposits. They're the youngest right on top, up to 300 feet thick. At the bottom, we have the Navajo sandstone, zero to 500. The Cayenta is in there, but it wasn't originally thought to be part of the Glen Canyon group, but now it's been added later on. Um, and then the Wingate, okay. And then the, the Paradox is here in the uh, Pennsylvania Hermosa group, which is really thick. It goes down forever. Here's the cross sections. So here's the valley. These are the sandstones. The green colors are all the, the different sandstones. Navajo, Cayenta, Wingate, going from lighter color green to darker color green. And then this is the alluvium, but it under, is underlain by this um, paradox formation. You can see the faults on the side. This is down here where we are. Up valley, there are actually some bits of sandstone that are on top of the paradox. Faults in there. This is the water budget that was done back in 1971. This is a very simple budget. He estimated two things. He estimated the amount of uh, groundwater that flows subsurface into the Colorado River at 8,000 acre feet per year, far smaller numbers than what Jack was throwing, but millions, right? And then he estimated the net groundwater withdrawal use from wells, it's in maybe spring 6,300, roughly 14,000. Uh, and then he assumed that there, this is how much is coming out. He assumed that it was in a steady state, so the same amount was going in as was coming out. That's it, he estimated two things. That's the total of those two. This was assumed to be equal. This is the whole area, the Spanish Valley area. So the inflow, so we have 15 inches of average precipitation that works out to 115,000 acre feet per year. Very small number, it doesn't rain a lot, right? 15 inches every year. This is the outflow, here's this 14,000. He estimated the outflow from Mill Creek and Pat Creek, all right? Mill Creek, remember that slide back here? Here, so here's Mill, here's Mill Creek, and this is Pack Creek, coming down the middle of the valley. So he estimated those at roughly 14, so he had a total of 28. He assumed that the amount coming in would be the same as the amount going out, so he said that the consumptive use was just the difference between the 28 and the 115. All right, pretty simple. Um, Remarkably close to what numbers are coming out now. Yeah, meanwhile, four million acre feet are going by in the color of exactly. All right. You have all this water that's running right by you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first modeling study, I, I focus this on modeling, the value of modeling systems. Uh, the first one was done in 77, and I put modern in parentheses because in 77, this was model, uh, modern. Using a computer as a model was modern. This was not a modern type of model, okay? In 2000, the first, what I would consider truly modern computer model was done as a MS thesis by this fellow at GYU, and this was his advisor. Um, this was done because they were gonna uh, divert 3,200 acre feet from per year through the Shelley Tunnel. You may or may not be familiar with that, okay? And then this one was done because um, there were 4,234 acre feet per year of water rights that were acquired by the Grand Water and Sewer Service Agency. And they wanted to know how much can we take of that without adversely affecting water quality? It's another thing about groundwater. You have to worry about, can we drink this stuff? Right? Is it going to be salty? Is it going to have pollution in from, from uh, agriculture? Right? And they decided that what the model proved that they could take all of it out and it wouldn't be adversely affected. Well, you don't want to take water out and then have what's left over be something that you can't use. So it makes sense, it's non consumptive. Uh, this is the report that I drew that long table of all the different geologic units. And then this was another, they used this model and they used this one, these same folks. This is the Utah Geological Survey. I actually know some of these people, Mike Lowe and um, Charlie Bishop, these guys. So he used, Bishop used this model by Downs and Kovacs to uh, recommend the minimum lot size for septic tanks. 
okay, in the appropriate um, density. In the central portion of Spanish Valley, he figured it could be 10 acres, and but in the southeastern portion at the headwaters, right down in the southeast over here in the corner of the previous map, and along the margins, there should be 20 acres, okay, because they don't want to contaminate the groundwater with the effluent coming from these areas where people are living. Is this making sense? Okay. So that's that model. Here, here the, here's the first of the of the big the big new studies that were done. The first two reports by the Coleman Vanderheide for the city of Moab. Uh, and the second one was the actual water budget. They developed their own water budget. The third report was just about um, the drinking water source protection. It had nothing to do with this. Um, but I read it and I gave a report. We can forget about that. The, Problem with the water budget is they actually have four water budgets. They did four water budgets. They did pre development and post development, and they also did a low estimate of consumptive use by phreatophytes. These are plants, you know, uh, cottonwood trees or phreatophytes. They take water out of the ground and they move it into the atmosphere and they actually remove a lot of water. Some folks go down and cut them. <laughs> I don't know if that's such a great idea. Anyway, uh, so these are the, the four budgets. This is pre development, the low consumptive use by the phreatophytes. You can see that these are the low numbers, these are the high numbers for the phreatophytes. They didn't know how much it was, and they were kind of making wild, I call them wags, wild ASS um, guesses. <laughs> we call them wags. I call them wags anyway. Uh, but you notice that the numbers all balance on these, regardless. So this is uh, pre development, this is post development, that's like today, modern. Okay, this is what it used to be. Jack talked about that. This is what it is now. The numbers that we can actually measure. Um, and the numbers have grown, as you can see, the amount. And once again, they assumed that recharge and discharge match. This is a, this is a assumed a steady state system. Uh, and it's an assumption. There's no proof to support this. It just makes doing a water budget relatively simple. Your numbers average at the end. So they're bigger now than they used to be. Right, um, but later on they did this last study because they included a larger area. They included the Spanish Valley. The first one was just the uh, Glen Canyon Mill Creek because there's, I mean, yeah, Glen <laughs> Mill Creek system. They didn't use the Grand Staff, which is off to the left because it doesn't come into this valley. But they ignored Spanish Valley. But, uh, this is the uh, Pat Creek, lower alluvium, the shallow stuff on the top. So they did another one, and they just did pre and post development. They didn't worry about the consumptive use by the three adipites on this one. Uh, and the numbers are, are bigger again, they balance it. But then the USGS, at the same time, they, they published their own report. Okay, and there's a lot of information here. Jack has lots of graphs and numbers and stuff. And I just have, because I read stuff, I just put down one summary of what they had. Um, this, the, my key takeaway is this is these folks from the USGS came out and they actually collected additional data. They didn't make up their numbers. They don't have a, a, an assumption of a steady state where the amount being taken out is the same as the amount coming in. And they, they uh, took a lot of, they did um, water samples from wells, springs, and surface water sites. They did data on this is, this is the unsaturated zone above the water table, which is actually very important. They took some samples from there, uh, spring and stream discharge measurements, how much water is there, okay, instead of just saying, well, this, that, whatever. They did uh, a geophysical survey and they drilled and tested 12 new wells down in the Matheson Preserve. They did a lot of really good quality data collection before they analyzed these things. They analyzed the water samples for uh, isotopes, noble gases, and this fellow, uh, Kip Solomon, is one of the world experts on noble gases. Okay, And then CFCs, which were released by, they, they were used as refrigerants until they found out it was creating an ozone hole, right? Now they're stopped, but they're still in the atmosphere. So you can tell by the quantity uh, in water when that water went into the ground because it came out of the atmosphere and has CSCs that may not be there anymore. Is this making any sense? Yeah. Uh, and then carbon uh, stable and uh, isotopes. 
They took cores in the beta zone. Anyway, recharge to the deep. They divided the, the Glen Canyon group aquifer, the, the Navajo, the Cayenta, and the Wingate. They divided that into a deep unit and a shallow unit. They said that the water chemistry in these two parts of these aquifers are not the same. They come from different places, and they can tell it by the isotopes. I can explain that. I don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to ask afterwards, I, I'll help with that. Uh, the recharge to the shallow Grand Canyon uh, group aquifer is probably, it only comes from the south mountains. It has to come from the south. The isotopes say that it is. Okay, uh, and the recharge of the shallow is probably from not far below the La Salle, uh, with little from sand flats. The, the assumption has always been where that sandstone is exposed at the surface on sand flats, that's where it's getting its recharge, and it is not. Okay, this, I'm convinced with these data that that's the case, all right? Um, Recharge the valley of alluvium is from the upper Pack Creek drainage and lost from Pack Creek itself as it flows through. It's losing water. That, that stream, Pack Creek, is losing water the whole time it goes into the groundwater. And then someone over here is pumping it out to irrigate alfalfa. Is that making sense? Uh, and they outflow to the Colorado River. The underflow out of the Matheson Preserve is much smaller than previous estimates. Then they didn't necessarily quantify that, but they said it can't possibly be as much as has been estimated in the past. And the overall groundwater budget is much less too. There's less water than we thought. And these data prove that. And then they came up with their own water budget, really revised, noticed, reduced, greatly reduced annual in 14, 15, and 16. They were out collecting data so they can actually do a water budget with collected data. And then the average groundwater budgets. So these are the budgets. So here's the total inflow. Here's the total outflow. All right. Well, these numbers match. There's a range. Wouldn't you expect there to be a range? Recharge. Look at recharge. Direct precipitation, uh, infiltration of precipitation varies by. Factor of three. Did Jack's data on the amount of water coming into the Colorado River, was that nice and steady and constant? No, this isn't constant either. All right. But this is a little more constant, isn't it? So, what this is, my interpretation of this is if we have a wet year, we're doing fine. If we have a dry year, we're taking more than's there and it's coming in. Okay, think of a groundwater aquifer basin, you've got water that was there in storage, like Jack showed, what, 2,000? It's full. And then people come in and they start drilling wells, they pump it out, and it starts going down. And this is saying, we're taking more out than is filling it back in, all right? We're draining more than is coming in through the tap. This goes on for much longer. Pretty soon, there's nothing left in the aquifer, just like there's nothing left in the reservoirs. Think of an aquifer as a reservoir that's filled with rocks or sediment, something like that. You can't see it, but it's down there. And it's huge. It doesn't have evaporation losses, but can we exhaust it? We're human beings. We can do whatever we want, <laughs> whether it's good or bad. And we may not know what we're doing is bad at the time we're doing it. We're happy to find water that's not in a reservoir because we have this groundwater in storage. But we need to manage that. And that's what the Division of Water Rights is here to do. Okay. Uh, this was a document that came out shortly afterwards by the same authors. Okay. And this is the one that I read that was most impressive to me. It left the strongest impression because they... Uh, it contains a prioritized list of seven monitoring suggestions. What should we do now that we have these new data? What do the USGS folks recommend that we do? Uh, continuous spring discharge measurements. Let's see what those springs are doing. Are the, is the discharge gradually decreasing with time? More than likely, are we keeping records? People paying attention to that? We should. Uh, water level monitoring in the wells. Are the water levels going down in the wells? Probably. 
How fast are they going down? That would be useful information, wouldn't it? And then some other things, um, stream gauge and upper pack creek, water quality sampling, continuous water quality monitoring. So sampling is what they did with the, all the analyses. Monitoring, this is measure the temperature and the conductivity of the water, which we can measure now. We can just put it on, water comes out, and we have a continuous record, and we can see if the temperature is changing and the conductivity is changing. Conductivity is a surrogate for water quality. The water quality is getting less, worse. The conductivity will go up. The temperature is changing. It usually gets warmer. That's not a good sign. It should stay the same. We'd like it to stay the same, but maybe it's not. We don't know. Data support future numerical groundwater uh, flow model. This is what I'm proposing to do. And then this other thing, which is USGS. Then there was a PowerPoint presentation made by some of these folks. I don't know if it was here. I don't know where they made the presentation. I just got the presentation. And I looked at it and I said, this is really great stuff. Okay. So this is this is one of their most important slides. So this is taken, as you notice, the other one we showed where the alluvium was. So this is showing the Pat Creek, the Valley Hill alluvium. This is showing the shallow Glen Canyon group uh, in the Mill Creek drainage. This is the deep. This is the only place where you actually see the deep rocks. These are up on top. These are down below. We have the fall the paradox formation, a little bit of a loom on top. This is kind of coming back. And this is how much, this is the amount of water annual discharge from these various options. 2,600 per year. The deep Glen Canyon group is 3,600. The shallow is 7,400. This is where most of it comes from. And then the grand staff part is only 1,100. I'm kind of difficult about what I'm wishing. You don't know how to. Where that's coming from. Yeah, the mute there. If you're on Zoom, um, please make sure you mute yourself. Thank you. Anyway, so these are the conclusions. The last slide presented conclusions. Uh, and they all methods employed are rel in relatively good agreement. So all the data that the USG has collected all point in the same direction. They don't contradict themselves. Okay. Groundwater can be separated in three distinct aquifers. Um, I showed you the three aquifers, the shallow and deep, as well as the valley of alluvium. Uh, and the shallow and deep was, was determined based on chemistry, uh, isotope chemistry. Stream loss from Pat Creek is the primary beach art source to the valley of alluvium. I mentioned that earlier. The sand flats area is not a source of recharge to the deep Glen uh, Canyon group aquifer. A little bit maybe to the shallow, but not even that much. Uh, flow through the valley field alluvium is less than previously estimated, and nearly all flow is consumed by evapotranspiration in Matheson wetlands. Almost nothing, no, almost no groundwater gets into the Colorado River. It goes to the Matheson wetlands and it gets evapotranspired there. Does that make sense? Uh, various methods produce consistent deep Glen Canyon group aquifer discharge of 3,600 acre, acre feet per year. Okay, this was. The, I forgot, I missed a, a sentence up there. The two most important aquifers are actually uh, um, the valley fill alluvium and the Navajo because it's on the top. So the idea is, what if we drill down into the Cayenta and down into the uh, Wingate? They have water in them. Will that lengthen, will that prolong the time that we can drain groundwater? And this is saying, no, there's not that much down there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Only 3,600. See, 3,600. This guy, 7,400. Well, maybe we can get way more than that. It's not there. And this is the cross section that they did from the LaSalle's down to the Colorado River. Here's the LaSalle's showing the water in the deep Lake Canyon aquifer is coming from the LaSalle's. Snow melted in the LaSalle's. If you notice, I was just up there yesterday. There aren't that many surface streams up there. You have all these fractured rocks, it goes down to fractured rocks and ends up going into the, into the uh, sandstones. There's a little bit that comes in on the shallow up here, but this is the sand flats. There's almost nothing coming here where it's nice and horizontal. This is the unsaturated Navajo. This is the yeah, green is just showing saturation. The blue lines are just showing the flow direction. Valley fell alluvium over here. Okay, so there's the summary. Um, conclusions. One thing I, I, 
I think that the document with the recommendations was the most important. I agree that the continuous stream discharge measurements and groundwater level monitoring uh, are the two most important. I think they're the same. You should be doing both at the same time. We have to monitor what's coming out now. The sooner the better. We get data, we, we will see if bad things are happening. Those discharges, the water levels are going down, discharges are going down, chemistry is changing. But I think that the sixth priority uh, to collect data support numerical modeling is that's my second priority. Uh, the modeling can be used to test these recently updated hypotheses regarding offer conditions. Can we get a model that says, yes, these data the USGS collected, this makes sense. We can, we can connect all these things and it works. Uh, the recently revised reduced groundwater budget estimates. Let's put in some smaller numbers in there and see how that works. Optimize the locations of additional groundwater monitoring sites. Where should we collect data? We don't have enough. Grand Canyon doesn't have enough money to collect all these data at the same time. Where is our money best spent? You know, maybe collecting stream measurements is not that valuable, but it's expensive. And then simulate changes to the groundwater system based on potential future changes in groundwater development and or climate. We can change how much comes in. Let's say we have a drought. Let's make a drought and the model will say, good luck finding water. Okay, extend the drought. This is really bad. We need to think about this. We can, uh, we can say, let's put in a big development over here and pump a bunch of groundwater out. How's that going to affect the system? We can play with this model however we want and see how, what effects we have by something that might actually happen in the future and then be prepared, collect some data and be prepared for that. Or maybe just say, no, we can't afford to do this. Anyway, I think I'm probably a few minutes over. Go to the icon and tap the icon, which is the square. Or which is... As per our advertisement, we were supposed to have Dr. Jane Belknap Jane, I know my is like <laughs> so right. um, but, um, Jane it, it has been was ill and she is home with him. So we have Mike Dunaway. He is um, Dr. Mike Dunaway. He is a research ecologist and soil scientist, the Southwest Biological Center, USGS. Dr. Mike Dunaway is a soil scientist focused, focused on soils and soil processes and dryland ecosystems and the interactions between environmental and land use drivers, vegetation soils, and geomorphology. His areas of focus include restoration, eco-hydrology, did I say that right? Yes. Oh, good. Effects of land use, grazing, energy, recreation, dust production, plant soil feedbacks, and soil mapping and interpretations. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. So I'm with the USGS. I'm not the part of the USGS that did all those great water studies. Moab is so important. We have two USGS offices. We have the water office downtown, and then we have our office right by the Park Service out there on Resource Boulevard, and we study soils and plants and other people in my part of the USGS study like polar bears and lawnmowers, <laughs> and I study a lot of soils. And so uh, I was just going to talk a little bit about the climate change forecasts, well, observed climate change. We've it's all been experiencing for the last 20 years when the millennial drought, uh, and then a little bit about the forecasts, and then share some of our data from Grand and San Juan County that might tell us a little bit about how the plants and the soils might respond to those forecasts, and then about what that might mean for water supply. Um, I felt a little bit like Al Gore, like making an inconvenient truth slide. It's like it's going to be the third presentation in a row. It's not going to be super, super hopeful, but bear with me. Uh, so, this is uh, a great resource. It's the National Climate Assessment. So, they have a Southwest chapter. They're, this is the one from 2018 to 2023. One was supposed to come out in September, but they don't have it up yet. But there's a lot of good information in here in the Southwest chapter. It should be any day that the new one comes out. It has good information about the forecast for the Southwest. We're in the Southwest, so it should be pretty relevant. Um, and just to make it easy, I'll start with the, the ending. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this very long, as long as I usually talk about it in presentations, but you guys all live in the desert. You know it's dry. Water is limiting for plants. We like to call them dry lands because they're such, they're such water-limited systems. 
Uh, we are already hotter than we have been in the past. It'll like, likely keep getting hotter. And for us, everywhere hotter means drier, right? Regardless of what the precipitation forecast for this region are kind of all over the map. Temperature forecasts are pretty robust and hotter means drier. Uh, and then a drier future will be, you know, even less productivity in our deserts, more exposed soils, more sensitive soils or more sensitive disturbances. You can see some, some of our experiments, and even the warming itself, are the damage from our biological soil crust that we love so much. Um, and that's going to mean more wind erosion and dust, and water Also, drier is going to mean drier likely. And then I think so taken together, the sort of interaction of the drying climate and our dry land systems and processes like erosion and fire sort of add to the risk and uncertainty that Tom and Jack have been talking about about the water supply, because these things don't tend to get factored in um, to forecast for water quality. Uh, all right, so dry lands are big heterogeneous systems. They have low and variable precipitation. They're primarily limited by water availability. So the plants, why there's black brush there and why there's grass there and why there's sagebrush here or PJ there. It's, it's almost all about water and the interaction of the precipitation, the temperature, and the soils that kind of govern what plants are there. And so we think about dry lands as being very tough and re resilient to drought. We all plant deer escaping in our front yard so that they're resistant to drought. But these systems have evolved with the climate of the past, right? They've evolved to be able to persist with the precipitation they get and the temperatures they're experiencing. And so with humans in tough dry land systems, if you dry them out more, things are going to change. They might change in ways we don't like, right? And so dry lands, uh, there's how the 100th meridian, being most of everything west of the 100th meridian is a dry land where precipitation is not sufficient to meet evaporative demand for water supply. We're doing what we would call an arid or semi-arid system here in Moab. What that looks like, so the blue bars are the monthly average precipitation from the airport. And it's kind of weird, we get about on average about the same amount of precip each month, more or less. June's a little drier, October's a little wetter, not this October. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, it's been, I mean, it's wonderful weather. <laughs> Uh, and then this red line there is potential evapotranspiration. T it can be measured in the same units as precipitation. Uh, and so what we get is in the winter, kind of this starts in November through April, we have our sort of water accumulation period where we have the amount of water coming in, just like the water budget for Colorado, the amount of water coming in is, is precipitation exceeds demand by plants. And then during our growing season, the atmospheric water demand gets huge. Right, and far exceeds the precipitation coming in. It's going to water our lawns and all that stuff and get our drip going. And this is really important concept when we start talking about looking at climate change forecast because the blue bars aren't going to probably aren't going to change very much on average. We're going to get a lot, all, much more variable in the wild, but they're on, maybe on average, we don't know which way it's going. But this red bar, red lines are going to shift up. Okay, we're doom and gloom. So we had, there was a great study in the Washington Post. <laughs> An article that came out, it was focused on Delta and farmers in Delta, and they just did these great maps of the temperature change from 1895 to 2018. We had this nice big bruise on western Colorado and eastern Utah, so we're sort of at the heart of warming in the western U.S. and actually the lower 48 is that we're right in the middle of that. This is like San Juan County right there is that really dark spot. Another study that an article that came out in the Guardian looked at rank the, the increasing average annual temperature of all the counties in the U.S. from 1895 to 2021, and we're number two. <laughs> Grand County is second, so that's like, we're not imagining it. It's definitely getting hotter. Uh, uh, Jack alluded to this too, the mega drought or the millennial drought. So these, uh, these folks from UCLA did this sort of cool reconstruction of historical drought from the Colorado River Basin using tree cord and other techniques. And that period, the millennial drought from 2000 to 2021, and it was the worst drought in 1200 years. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but um, this map right on the left, on, on the top there has those colorations. You, know, you don't want to be darker red on there, but we are darker red. 
a lot of it. So that's the ranking of those pixels for how we rank in terms of that 1200 year period. And so we're like one, two, three, four, something like that in order to where we are on that millennial trout. This figure on the right is really interesting. ACC is going to put in a climate change. So people can take those climate models and sort of use them to ask questions like what would the weather have been like, like likely been like if we hadn't had anthropogenic climate change. And we aren't, you know, we're not winning anymore. We're sort of, it's only the worst in 15 years, the, the top 15 or maybe more than that, you know, where, where we would have been if we hadn't had anthropogenic climate change for the this the millennial drought. And then just to bring it home, this is the Drought monitor on the bottom there from Grand County for that 20 year period. You know, this is a measure of relative drought for drought severity. Again, darker red or the dark, dark red is bad. And then the y axis is the percent of the county that's in drought. And so you can see that early part of it, the early 2000s, some um, like 11, uh, 2012, 2013, and then the latter part of that period. So we're definitely experiencing these things that the scientists are talking about. To bring it even more locally, this is data from uh, the Needles Ranger Station. So the Needles Ranger Station, we have had a, a run their station there since 1967. We have a lot of research down in the Needles that I'll be talking about a bit. And this is just showing, this is the top one is temperature, so it's normalized to average. So things that are above it that are red are warmer than average, things that are below it that are blue are cooler than average. And we have a very, very robust warming trend in San Juan County. Uh, 0.257 degrees C per decade. And then if you tease it out by season, it's actually really the summer and the fall, like we're experiencing right now, that are getting hotter. And that's important because that's that growing season when that, that vapor, that, that red line is getting pushed up because of that increasing temperature. So we're getting more suction out of more water loss during the growing season. Uh, again, another study, there's a lot of studies from <laughs> Southwest and the Four Corners. This one, uh, looking at the Four Corners region, focusing on forage. And so this graph here on the right is this vapor pressure deficit. So it's related to potential vapor transpiration, but it's sort of a metric of how much water the atmosphere can suck out of the soil and the plants and stuff. And this is another study where they sort of did this exercise where they asked, what would the vapor, vapor, pressure, vapor pressure deficit have looked like we hadn't had climate change. And they call it their time of emergence. So these red lines are where they're observed, their, their estimated vapor pressure deficit from climate change sort of exceeds the historic gap. So this again relates to this millennial drought. So the take home from this is that 2003, four, five period is where that warming that we were experiencing was shifted the atmosphere of water demand beyond a range we have experienced before. Or, you know, let's, uh, this is another figure. So in addition to sort of average warmer conditions, we can expect more uh, sort of periods of extreme heat. So this is from the, the 2018 National Climate Assessment for the Southwest. And this is uh, the change in the number of days that exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit for the period 2036 to 2065. So, not too far from now, compared to 1976 to 2005. So we're very robust. We're going to get warming on average and more sort of hot drought type activities um, going forward. Uh, and then that, you know, the warmer and the drier is going to translate into increased water demand um, for agriculture, as well as for its plants and the soils in general. The soils will be getting drier. So these are just more forecasts for towards the end of the century for changes in soil moisture on the left there, and then a right continuing you know, more for, forecast for shifts in soil moisture, so having the soil moisture deficit going down. Uh, zooming in a little bit more, this is a study by my colleague at the USGS who does sort of forecast and soil water forecast going forward. Sort of, this is another, just another way to look at it, the projected number of dry days in the soil profile. And so we are, Particularly like south, like San Juan County and south, is this, you know, the darker reds have more shift in the number of dry days, but we're within that region where we kind of could expect an increase in the number of dry days based on John's model. And then uh, 
As you guys know, when the runner rains, the soils get the first drink. So when thinking about Tom's sort of runoff models or any kind of infiltration or deep recharge, we have to satisfy that water deficit of the soil first before any of that water is going to make it out the bottom. Depending on the nature of the rainfall, you might also need to saturate or have enough water on the soil to get the runoff to happen. And so the drier soils might need less surface water and potentially less groundwater recharge, depending on where it's happening. Uh, okay, so what does this all mean for the Colorado Plateau and Grand County? We have a lot of our systems. Everything from the Ponderosas would be included in the dry land all the way down to the dry deserts and canyon lands. And then we have this important biological soil process, which is a defining part of our ecosystem on the plateau. We see all, we have all the little signs. We go in the park, so I don't bust the crust. Uh, these are the, the biological soil crust and plants are really important for soil stabilization, increasing infiltration, reducing runoff, eliminating erosion due to wind and water. Uh, and so these, I'm just going to share some results from some of our work, I think it's all USGS work in Grand and San Juan County. So the way, so my part of the USGS, we don't do the forecasts. We really are very interested in how those forecasts translate into the impact on the soils. And so the water and, uh, and ecosystem on the plateau. And so the way we uh, think about climate change is we do experiments and we have a lot of long-term monitoring. So we have these on the left here are these warming lamps that Jane Belknap put in in the mid 2000s. There's some in Castle Valley, there's some in Spanish Valley. They're actually physically warming the environment like we would expect for climate change. And then the other way we look at climate change and think about the impacts on the plants and soils is by modifying the amount of precipitation coming in. A lot easier. You don't have electricity bill to pay. Um, we do that with these funny looking sort of drought shelters that remove some portion of the incoming precipitation to simulate those future warmer and drier conditions. And then we have long term monitoring, mostly in the parks, but other places too, going back to the 90s, of like plant cover, soil cover. And we do a lot of work with wind erosion and dust. And so these, these images on the right there are some of our sediment traps we use to measure wind erosion and horizontal sediment flux. Uh, okay, so uh, one of the things we have observed that's a little bit disturbing is this is from the Needles District. This is a long-term study put in in 1996 where we measure the biological soil crust every twice a year, every year, and we see them actually negatively declining in response to that warming that we had in particular starting about 2002. And then this sort of complicated, so these are some images of the repeat photography of the crust, and it's mostly the lightning components that's going away from the warming. And then this figure on the right is showing what we call hysteresis, meaning we're like pushing the biological soil crust down with that warming. Even when it cools and cools off, we have cool years or cool periods, the crust aren't coming back. And so this is the sort of this blue line is sort of would be the crust cover you'd expect if they were still able to like respond like a rubber band and being stretched and pulled is coming back. But what we've been watching is it's more like rubber band snapped, and even when it's cooling, the biological soil crust aren't coming. Um, and then we see this is a paper by my colleague Sasha Reed and Jean Belknap from the warming experiments, and we see the similar trends of loss of biological soil crust from the warming. We do some of these still maintain some of the soil stability, so it's not like all is lost, but they are losing some of their functions from the warming. Uh, and with the plant cover, this is just one of our studies we were looking at for plant cover in that same part of the needles district. You know, we see fluctuating cover of, of plant communities, total cover, and response to the warming and the drying conditions. And surprisingly resilient, except the one thing that's very worrisome is this last trend here for that, la I'm going back up quite a few slides to the, the drought monitor, you know, that the, the last few years has been really dry, extremely drought conditions, and this year, perennial grass is dropping to almost zero. Uh, and then with our, our other experiments, where we're sort of manipulating the desert to look at future conditions, understand what the desert might look like under future climates. For plant cover, we have these sort of things that are reducing one third of the precipitation, which is somewhat analogous to what we expect from the warming. And from what that, we see a lot of mortality of our, of our native grasses. On this bar chart on the left here, the uh, open bars are ambient, so that's mortality of tag individuals just in response to the actual, uh, just the, the natural ambient drought conditions. The gray bars are added mortality due to sort of sweat reductions in soil water from the, from the experiment. And this primarily uh, the cool season grasses, some warm season grasses, and a few, a few shrubs, but the shrubs are more resilient. 
Um, and then that mortality, these are just cover figures. So we're losing total cover from uh, during the millennial drought period, as well as increased loss of cover due, due to the experiments kind of across functional types, including the biological surplus. Uh, so one of the things I'm very interested in, this relates more directly to the, to the questions of the, about uh, uh, wind, uh, water quantity is wind erosion and dust. And so this, uh, we have a number of studies that have documented the increasing response, the increasing horizontal mass flux, which is like dust, right? Uh, in response to increasing temperatures, these figures on the left are just sort of documenting from the national parks, increased model wind erosion, just responding to increases in temperatures from the early to, from the about 2000 to 2000, or, uh, 1989 to 2010. And then this figure on the right is some synthesis work that we did sort of taking those funny looking mailbox things. We use them all over the place to measure dust, wind erosion and dust, and just sort of looking at the, 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 the quantities um, across different land types. And so our undisturbed bars on the left there, the y-axis is units of flux log scale. So each, each, each tick is a tenfold increase. And so what we see going from the undisturbed to you know, vegetation treatments, which could be like pink and juniper removal, fire conditions, like improper livestock grazing, uh, off highway vehicles, oil and gas development, we get a 10 to 100 fold increase in measured dust from those, act from those activities. Um, and so, I, you know, this, this is not new, right? The, you think of a dust bowl, we're all familiar with the dust bowl is driven by drought and land use activities, you know, tearing up plants and soils. And so that we have a similar sort of experience now in the drylands of the Southwest where, you know, drought, plus disturbance increases horizontal mass flux or wind erosion. This is from, we have dust cameras. This is one about near looking at North Six Shooter. Got another one island in the sky, one of the Abajo, there's one that there are available on the CNA tool, CNA, CNAA website. And this is a photo down there taken a couple hours apart. Um, interesting side note, you know, we think about the dust, de deserts being a dusty place. Colorado Plateau is not naturally a dusty place. There's these cool studies where they can look at like lake environments in the San Juan Mountains that have been like natural dust traps for millennia. And they're, they, the scientists that do this work estimate that this is like the dustiest period we've had in 11,000 years. And the dust matters, it matters for our visibility and uh, air quality, but for this conversation, it matters a lot for water quantity and snow. There was uh, our colleague up at University of Utah Kinsey Skiles and our students did this cool study. It was in the news quite a bit in Utah about linking sort of dust emission from the Great Salt Lake to the Wasatch, and then that impacting the, the snow, the, the length of the, of the ski season and the, and the snowpack. So what happens is when the dust from the desert comes lands on the snowpack, turns the snow. You can see this dust line here in the Wasatch snow. When that dust gets like when the snow melts and that dust gets on top. It changes the albedo in terms of from being a very white reflective, reflecting heat surface to something that's absorbing a lot more heat. And that can increase the rate of the snow melt, which actually can translate into less water. So there's been so a lot of work done on that in the San Juans. This is a, a study from Tom Painter and Jane Belknap and colleagues. Did a lot of work. There was a big, 2009 was a big dust year. And they did some work um, estimating the impacts of that dust on the snowpack, changes to the albedo, made the snowpack and the, the rocks melt three months mm. early. And they estimate in this study that that reduced overall Colorado river flows by 5%. The locks, right? We just learned all about we don't have enough water. And there's a, for us, you know, we don't have the Wasatch, McKinsey's work with the Wasatch is great because there's like a lot of people focus on the snow and the source right there and the sink right there with the dust on the snowpack of the Wasatch. Our story of like, Dust on snow for the LaSalle's, for the San Juan and the Rockies is a lot more complex. A big chunk of it comes from the Four Corners, you know, the Navajo Nation area, but then there's a lot of distributed dust that, that is contributing to this issue of dust on snow and water quantity. And it's a pretty complex system to figure out how that all interplays. And it hasn't actually been, I don't, from my understanding, that the dust on snow and the changes in the albedo haven't really been factored into sort of water quantity forecasts for the basin. And this is a photo by our colleague Travis Nauman. So we do get dust on snow on the LaSalle. This is from 
This is a picture of Took uh, between 513 and 517 of 2022. So, yeah. And so, and I don't, we have, there's been uh, the, we, no studies. We don't know. I mean, I'm assuming this is going to decrease sort of the recharge of the aquifers, but we, we don't know. Uh, the last little bit of fun is fire, right? We, there's fires been increasing globally in the U.S. and all the big fires in Quebec and, uh, and Australia over the last few years. Um, this is again from the fourth national climate assessment, sort of this, again, this technique of like asking what the extent of fire would be without climate change. And so we see sort of this would be this, yellow would be their ex estimated extent of cumulative forest acres burned without climate change. And we're like, what is that doubling? More than doubling with climate change. And this is driven by warming temperatures. So this is a, a, another figure. So the one on the left there, that x-axis is fuel aridity, so how dry are the fuels. The y-axis is areas burned. Blue dots are pre-2000, red dots are close to 2000. So the blue and the red are kind of on the same line, right? But the red is all mostly skewed higher, right? So we're getting drier conditions, increased vapor pressure deficit, is drying the fuels, you know, making larger fires. And then this is a this is a, um, a picture of our colleague Craig Allen, who's down at the Pantelier National Monument. This is a big pinion die-off that they had there, but we are also experiencing uh, we had a big juniper die-off period in the early two. I mean, the pinion die-off in the early 2000s, the same period as this. And then particularly around the Abajos area and, and uh, Bears years, we had a large juniper die-off uh, in the 2020, 2019. Um, and so this, of course, translates into fire. This is, you know, we had our big Pat Creek fire, which was almost 10,000 acres in 2021. Um, you know, this... It's a photo taken by our, my uh, colleague, Rebecca Figger-Higgins, who's doing some post-fire monitoring. Uh, and uh, you know, when you post-fire, you have less soil cover, less vegetation cover, burn soils often, so you get increased runoff and erosion and decreased infiltration, which we experienced with the floods in Moab last year. And this you know, has complicated interactions with the water availability. You can imagine if, a lot of this water is infiltrating in Lower Pack Creek. It might be a wash, but we, we, I, I just don't know. Um, all right, I'm almost done. Okay, the number one message from the Southwest chapter of the National Climate Assessment was about water resources. This is the text on the left. You know, it's Southwest has declined during droughts, in part due to human caused climate change. Uh, we need to suggest that we need flexible water management and techniques that address changing risk over time, among other things. Uh, so I do think sort of this interaction of drying up the deserts, dust on snow, fire, or sort of adding to that uncertainty and risk in our water. Um, yeah, with that, I think I'm done. My same take home as before, mostly just trying to hammer home these are water limited system, drier, it's gonna get hot, continue to get hotter, hotter means drier, it means more uncertainty in the water. To or you know, Q and A for you guys, and I'll kind of facilitate that. And maybe we'll try to say like an eight. We'll be out of here if that's okay with you guys. Or Slowly. Yeah, so, um, and if you guys just kind of want to stay where you are, however you want to do it, but do you have any questions? <laughs> so, I have a question that would combine my I appreciate Tom. Okay. Tom, in your recommendations, you're talking about you know, putting in certain um, well monitoring gauges and so on. And Mike, you're talking about predictions based on how it's been changing. Are, is there a way to combine those two? In other words, the monitoring wells that would be added, you know, will slowly gather No, no, we monitor existing wells. But okay, but that's monitoring. So you're figuring, trying to get at avoiding over appropriation and using actual well monitoring 
so, so it's just keeping track of where the water levels are in the wells that are right. being used so now. That varies different years. And yet there's clear trends. No matter no matter the variability over the next five, six, seven years. Are those data being combined? Like no, we're collecting. And is there a way to do that? The, the data are very different. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to do, um, like, so we have a, a Colorado River Basin wide dust on snow study, trying to make all those linkages between sort of the emissions and the dust on snow changes in water quantity. It seems like for our, if, you know, are you at your you're trying to ask about like the dust on snow and how that relates to the water availability? Yeah, I think it would be nice to try to, and then we, to apply those that work to the Los Alas. I know um, McKinsey's group who did the Wasatch as part of our study and they have been doing some snow pits up in the Los Alas. That would be nice to like figure out how to connect, you know, the changes in water runoff from changes in the snow albedo to the recharge. The, the problem with groundwater is the length of time that it takes to flow from the recharge areas to the discharge areas. The water coming out today could be decades to centuries to right. millennia since it actually recharged the ground. So I'm just, I guess I'm wondering whether the estimation of how close you are to overappropriation is underestimating how close we are given the warming trends and the dust and snow. The, and the modeling might shed some light on that because in modeling you can you can set the time however you want. You can you can run a computer for a few minutes and you can simulate centuries right. or decades. So we say we have these trends. Let's put those into the model and see what that does several decades down the road when this shows up at the bottom end. Am I making any sense there? <laughs> I'm just. At, at kind of a bigger at, all, at kind of a bigger scale, you can be glad there was a lot of snow last year. Might be again this winter. And there is the sense, oh, we get some buffer. Jack talked about that. Right. <laughs> Maybe, now, I, maybe I what, I, maximum I 24 months? Is, 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 in, in reservoirs, so well, I mean, we can drastically reduce consumptive use and then we'll get a longer buffer. That's what we're going to need to do. Yeah. We may have to do it. I guess numbers. I'm thinking the Utah Division of Water Rights, are they combining mo monitoring with clear trends? Oh. Not that I'm aware of. Well, then. How? Who's going to do that? Well, they, they look at data. The idea, honestly, my, my hope is that the results of the modeling study will be looked at seriously by the Division of Water Rights. I agreed with your local representative that everything that we do uh, will be, you know, moving along. It's going to take a couple of years, but we'll be doing reports, you know, like two or three times. This is what we did this last three or four months. This is how far we've gotten. And I, I intend, and I said this, and I'm serious uh, with Mark Spilson, we will share everything we do with you folks so that at the end, they'll have, hopefully have bought into this. They'll see where we've been going, and the results will be something that they will accept because they were, they were seeing it as it was coming out. It wasn't some, sorry, but a USGS document. <laughs> That dramatically changes what they were doing before. Okay, it's, it's, no, but honestly, honestly, it's just, it, it wasn't the, I want them to be involved in the whole process. So at the end, it's not some big shocking surprise that they don't expect to see. All right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like being a professor, right? Like students are turning in assignments, they're turning in uh, exams. And I grade them and hand them back right away. I don't wait till the end of the semester and say, oh, well, I'm sorry, you got a D. Does that make sense? That they're unhappy with. I give them a chance to see what's coming. And then when they get the D, it's like, yeah, well, I 
sort of deserve that. <laughs> 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 and so, um, so this is maybe a little bit of a stretch, but I, what I sort of see are two things going on. There needs to be the monitoring, the understanding of the system. Um, and that takes a lot of work. And it's because we are relying in our area on um, groundwater, most of us aren't seeing that. And so our water supply is very abstract for most people. Um, also looking at a lot of the vegetation work that's been done, I'm from what I saw today, and this is probably just from what you were presenting today, Mike, um, mostly in dryland areas. And I work a lot in riparian zones. And something I noticed this year that I've been pondering and trying to figure out what the heck's going on is a shocking number of elm trees are dying. Not that I really care, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, an amazing number of them in the riparian area. Um, and I'm noticing that up and down all of elm trees. Mm. Are there ways to, or are there things that could be thought about with some of the monitoring and also looking at some of the riparian areas and some things that people may be able to see more tangibly? Because when you see recapture reservoir drop, right, you go, oh, crap, we don't have water, but we don't have that here. Is there some canary in the coal mine for our area that could help people get a sense of that? Or is that just impossible? I can't think of something, a reason why it would, would not be impossible. <laughs> people, people don't, uh, I've, I suspect Jack knows about this. I have served as expert witness in, in court cases, and it's very hard to explain groundwater to folks. I went to one meeting, it was with the Division of Water Rights, um, and there was a fellow that was protesting uh, a new well, and I, and I was, hired to show that it wasn't going to affect anybody in the area. And he, after I gave my presentation, he was satisfied. And, and what, what I would take away from that, what I remember is at the end, he said, groundwater to me is a divine mystery. And I think that's what it is for most people. I can tell you teaching classes in this over the last 30 years, students come in with some of the strangest notions that I hope by the end of the semester, they realize, no, that is not how it works. Okay. It's, so I'm not sure that it would be easy to put that to the general public. I'm really focusing on the division of water rights because they're the ones that are legally allowed to make these decisions. I would like them to make decisions based on sound science. And I'd like to think that I do sound science. So anyway. What about the springs? One of the things right. was the, the springs monitoring was one of the recommendations. Absolutely. So that How many of you know where there. the springs are in this area that are used for water? And do you ever go out and look at them? And can you even see them? Do they have buildings? I haven't actually visited. There, there are some outdoor locations that are into the back end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do, do, do the, does the general public pay any attention to no. this? Do they, are they even aware that some of their water comes from springs? Maybe. But, but they are the canary, yeah, for groundwater. Well, there are a lot of levels in the wells are because we get a lot more water out of the wells. Honestly, that's that's what I want to see is mon water level water level monitoring. If we're seeing water levels in wells, and they go up and down seasonally, right? You pump more in the summer, and they come back up. But if it's looking like the Colorado River, where it's going like this in the long term, that would be the canary in the coal mine. You know, I would say, yeah. you know point to Colleen or myself as a hunter, I think people that are on the ground, like a cattleman or cattlewoman or a hunter, like I notice springs and I know I've talked to ranchers up in the book, but they're like very intimate, you know, they know springs and if they're have, are rebounding or on the decline. And so I do think there are those people that have that knowledge, right? People that are on the ground. I'm gonna go to Doug. Um, this might be a question for uh, you and Bill and Ronnie, but has anybody invited the alfalfa farmers to the table? They're using quite a bit of water. Right. We have not. I mean, we, you know, like at a county level right now, we've just been infusing money into, you know, monitoring, modeling. Um, and I don't know if we've got, we've not really started to dive deep down into stakeholders that are involved, right? That's, yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. an interesting question. Do you want to add anything to that, Bill, or Ronnie? Um, it's a very political issue. It's a very charged question. Um, a little bit of 
research research would show you that the second largest holder of water rights in the valley behind Moab City is someone who has a lot of alfalfa. So it's, it's a huge political. So I was, um, I attended the Conservative Climate Summit that John Curtis put on a month ago, whatever. And I went to the agricultural presentations and, and the, the folks from the uh, Utah Farm Bureau were there. And um, at the, the agriculture, the alfalfa, that all, they're all at the table at that level um, because I think they all recognize exactly what's going on and they're scared. Um, that was my, that was my takeaway. Everybody's there because they're scared. Um, but um, one of the speakers was a guy named Greg Simmons, and he is a legacy rancher. And he was talking about um, the amount of ground cover and the loss of ground cover and the infiltration from rain. And in a desert environment, we only get nine inches of rain. If you do not have ground cover, the infiltration rate is like two inches and the rest runs off. Um, versus if you have ground cover. And I know that is, you know, from your slides, that's an issue. Um, he talked about landscape restoration that he was involved in, and he might be somebody to, he's up in, in Northern Utah, to bring down here to talk about landscape restoration. The closing speaker was a, a, a Chinese American man who has worked all around the world on landscape restoration, major, major landscape restoration. And his comment was, I don't know, 40 or 60% of the, you know, the, the, the world um, has had denuded landscapes. And so mm -hmm. this is in China, this is in Africa, this is, this is an issue all around the world. And my question to you all is, do you deal with this landscape restoration? Because, you know, we've got all these monitoring and these issues, but there are some solutions out there that people are actually doing. Um, with landscape restoration that? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot happening now with the bipartisan infrastructure law and then the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of money for restoration. There's a, like, there's a really active area of research thinking about like adaptation or mitigation of the climate change issues through restoration. Yeah, because drylands are 40% of the earth's surface. You know, there's a big chunk of them are in some level of degradation and there's a huge opportunities there for destroying them. I don't know about like the particular, like how that would translate to the particulars of Grand and Grand County's water availability in the short term. But yeah, it's definitely an opportunity. Yes. So um, I noticed that there was a, a lot of the data stopped at 2020. Like Jack, you said that the upper basin has reported upper basin use since 2020. And I wonder, I, I didn't notice as much in your office it stopped, the data stopped in 2020 also. But it makes me really think how, like some of the research that Megan and I are lucky enough to be involved in, we're with Chris Wachowski a lot in the stream flow, and he's able to pull up real-time data mm -hmm. and like stack a couple different gauges and say, here's what's going on down here. Mm -hmm. And it makes me really think about the importance of having real-time stuff so that we know this is what it looked like in 2021, this is what it looked like in 2022, as we're getting our groundwater coming in and monitoring and stuff. And I, I hear the same need and the question that these two asked too, as far as like, is that available <clears throat> for you all for council members and for just like up-to-date real-time information? Yes, um, yes. I mean, I know where to access that data, yeah. And and we've had Chris come and speak a few times. We have Mark come and, you know, the, the Pack Creek gauge is something that we, it was a collaborative effort with, I think it was groundwater and sewer ourselves, San Juan County, uh, putting that gauge on just, I think it was just a year ago-ish. So, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, through the level of monitoring the wells, too. I don't know what more is going to water supply. You know, that's all on the vision of water rights, and, and you can see all those, the modern, modern wells. Um, but yeah, we should probably think about getting that on the website, the county's website, the city's website, to be a little bit more accessible to the average person. Because yeah. I know where to find it, but yeah, that's probably, there's ways to get it out there a little bit more, for sure. Yeah, yeah would be great. Other questions? Yeah. Just 
it, and it relates to what you were saying. I, I didn't understand why the no, the not reporting since 2020 of use. Is it that it takes some years? What What's behind that? <laughs> Okay, two different things. Uh, well, first off, it's um, straightforward to report physical processes like stream flow. So that's right, we can dial up and see what the river's flowing right this instant. Um, reporting consumptive use, use by humans is a slower and more painful process to accumulate the data. <clears throat> In the lower Colorado River Basin, reclamation uh, water is, is uh, accounted for in a very detailed way in real time by all the diversions tracked by <clears throat> um, reclamation. The calendar year ends on December 31st reclamation must report the water use annually by order of the Supreme Court. And that, and that report is issued in the middle of May. And there's somebody working on that pretty much every day to get it out by the middle of May. In the upper basin, it's a little less orderly, it's not mandated by the Supreme Court. And, uh, but I would tell you that it's unconscionable that we don't have data since 2020. Like, how are we supposed to, how are we supposed to manage the damn river system if we don't even know how much water is being used? Yes. But there isn't a Supreme Court mandate that forces the issue. But the one other thing to say, is that if I was really faithfully representing the data, the line that shows trans basin diversions would be a precise line because there are sensors on every damn tunnel. And we know that number precisely. The amount of water that we estimate used by agriculture has much greater uncertainty. You know, you can measure agricultural area by area. This is what everything would be. Satellites, but you've got to estimate how much water is being used. And every diversion and every return flow is not measured, especially in the upper basins. Now the upper basin commission has embarked on new studies which are using high-end state of the science techniques to estimate evapotranspiration from farm fields called eddy flux towers. Um, they're all caught up in the details of it. And so they don't want to release numbers from the old way. So they would look at some of the numbers I showed, which are all the official numbers of our government, right? If we can't trust this stuff, I don't know what the heck to do. But some people would say, well, we've got better science, but the better science means we don't have any numbers. So it's all tied up in getting the best science, but people don't want to release the data. I would argue that it's a bit of a mess since we're kind of flying blind. But there is a much different mandate to reporting data in the lower basin. So was it in 2023 that we finally got 2020 data? I mean, it's, is there usually a no no no? It's no, it's very slow now. The 2020 data probably came out in early 2022. But there hasn't been anything since, and it's not good. Yeah, the movement. Yeah, I just want to. So I'm kind of mentally connecting the dots in my head. So I was able to not attend the Water 101 session, but uh, I was sent a link, and it's available on YouTube. And 
I hope you post that as well as yes, the link for sure. this recording. Um, there's a lot of talk, as Tom was talking about, uh, you know, our groundwater supply is probably approaching its safe yield. Um, and as a result, the city of Moab, city of Spanish Valley are starting to look towards alternative water sources, such as Mill Creek, um, which itself is a spring fed river system uh, coming out of the groundwater. Uh, I'm just wondering priority wise, maybe Tom, Jack, I don't, Michael, let you go since I know you're a local. Um, <laughs> if you were a, a city uh, commissioner, you know, would you, given the fact that we're getting drier, um, runoff will probably be decreasing, would you be prioritizing conservation right now or would you be prioritizing, you know, seeking for alternative water sources? Oh, uh, you should answer that. You should answer that, Jack. <laughs> Jack answered that question in his presentation. Yeah. I have completely avoided it because there's the answer. We yeah. need to read Well, you're still use. employed by the state of Utah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no way around the... Okay, I'm not going to speak this to, to Grand County. I, I don't have any business speaking. I don't know this enough. So I'm going to speak in a grand, big way. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we talk about the equity between the upper and lower base. Well, we were each going to get our share, you know, but equity can be defined in many different ways. And as we look at the brave new world ahead of us, there's no possible way that this isn't about agricultural water. I mean, if you're a farmer, trust me, you feel like you got a target on your back. I mean, you can, we can understand why agriculture is so nervous and why we have to treat this in an economically just and sympathetic way that you don't just crash communities and crash lifestyles. But when 70% of the water is used by agriculture, in a sense, the Colorado, well, Mark Reasoner, right? Yeah. Right? Well, Reasoner is famous for have said, said, the West doesn't have a water supply crisis. So water, the West has a water allocation crisis. I mean, in a sense, we don't actually have a crisis in the Colorado River. We're tying up 70% of the water growing crops. And most of that's going to livestock feed. It's not growing kale and broccoli and you know, <laughs> cauliflower. Um, and what? Just cheeseburgers. There, yes, just cheeseburgers. And, and, and I eat meat, and so I don't get a free pass to make <laughs> So it's just, it, it necessitates sympathy and understanding and sociology and economics. It's not easy. But on the other hand, this is not a hard problem. We just have to be using water in an efficient way, growing the right kind of crops that are efficient in their use and efficient in their economic return, growing them in the right parts of the country. Now, unfortunately, that whole view is so contrary to free enterprise, the American West, nobody tells me what to do. It implies top-down control that is anathema to a Westerner. And I don't know how we get ourselves out of this jam, but we got a hell of a lot of water. And it's sitting in the Uinta Basin, irrigating massive amount of crops, you know, in the Uinta Basin. I, I can't, I really don't know a damn thing about how much water is being used here. But in the state of Utah, it's a whole lot, and it's mostly going to alfalfa, and the price of alfalfa is sky high, and you can't blame a person for trying to get the best economic return. But at some point, we got an awful lot of water that's buffered. The only part of the West that is in a complete jam is Southern Nevada, because they have no buffer. They can't save any more water, right? They, there's only so much lawn you can rip out. You know, you're not going to save water ripping out concrete. And so, I mean, and they got no alfalfa. They just don't have any water to trade. A lot of other places do. So my answer is um, it's 
got to come from ag, and yet I am utterly understanding how complicated it is. Let me ask you just a couple more points. So if you take away or limit that, do you feel like that then again, you're going to have a heating problem? Oh, you mean from removing the ground cover and having bare ground? Well, I can't believe that's going to be the strategy we use. Yeah, the definitely a concern, like uh, fallow fields, right? The some of the amazing dust pictures. Dust bowl. Uh, dust bowl, but like Arizona, they have like the haboobs in Arizona. A lot of that's from you know old cotton fields, and, and those storms moving across. There's nothing growing there, so that yeah, it should, hopefully that wouldn't be the strategy. We just have fallow fields that have been dust. And there's so no, the nothing to be. Yeah, and there's nothing to be said that the pressure needs to be put on urban America to keep saving relentlessly. And, you know, one of the things to understand is that when you look at the biggest cities in the basin, L.A., all Southern California, Phoenix, Denver, those areas have all grown in population substantially, and their total water use in all of those big cities has gone down that per capita water use is plummeting, that you can have continued growth in population, and yet the total amount of water used by those cities has plummeted. So, I mean, everybody's got to do something, and you can ask agriculture to bear all of it, but certainly it's got to be, it, it, yeah, some. Maybe last I one. I just wanted to point out that while seventy percent of water in Utah is being used by AI, seventy percent of water in Grand County is not being used by AI. Yeah. So I think that's another like to, to bring this back to a local level. It's really important to really get that context. That's um, yeah. Because, because it it is a little different here. I don't recall. I know the city back <clears throat> when it had a water conservation advisory board. Uh, we we compiled. City use, we didn't do county, and I can't remember offhand. I should have grabbed that before I came up here tonight. But it it was it was outdoor water use because I'll also say that differently. There's ag water use, and then in the city, and the amount of um, lawns that get put in. I mean, that's not functional outdoor. Like I'm all for an alfalfa field over an acre of grass around someone's house. And so I think that's another thing to be looking at is our local area. If we're really worried about Grand County is how is it being used and is it actually more than aesthetic? Is there a function? Is it, is, it, is it making a cow that's then making a cheeseburger? Or is it making a lawn that you're mowing every week? There's, those are two very different things. And I think in Grand County, if I recall right, there's more lawns than that. Than that. 70 percent is is the basin the entire basin and just to be clear it's not just the upper basins the i mean the uh culprit in the imperial valley they're growing 70 percent is alfalfa that's being shipped overseas you know for horse farms and stuff so it's going on all over the basin it's certainly not right to simply pin it on the upper basin so I do want to start wrapping it up. If you guys want to just hang around, and I might just hang around for a few minutes, if people want to kind of wrap.